Ricky, you've um, put forward some brilliant questions which um, touch on a very important subject for me uh, working for Spitfire. The questions are, Spitfire makes some fantastic sample libraries, thank you very much. You all work very hard to make them, uh, the guys in town definitely do. But at the end of the day, and this goes for any sampling company, are orchestral samples being used on movies? Two, if they aren't, a great sample library is used simply to impress directors when you show them demos. Three, but if they are used in movies alongside orchestras, where is the fine line of how much and how little to use as samples? Four, finally, do you personally ever use orchestral samples on the film projects you work on? I would add question number five, and I don't know if you're skirting around it, but it's a question I'd like to address. And question five for me is, do orchestral sample libraries put musicians out of work? The answer to the first part of your question is, of course, yes. I mean, very few budgets can extend to a full-blown orchestra for most film and TV projects. Indeed, actually, that was one of the reasons why Spitfire Audio was founded at first, to solve a conundrum for Paul and I, and that was that we didn't have the budgets uh, to you know, book symphony orchestras. So we needed samples to create mock-ups uh, with smaller chamber bands. The other reason you hear samples in the actual masters is because of the magic of sampling, you know, taking something organic and making it do something it couldn't do in real life, whether that be a kind of cheeky pizzicato line or, I don't know, how would a live drummer handle a BT glitch edit, for example? Or indeed, Hans' is love of taking the kind of smallest and quietest signal and making it the largest, most thunderous thing in the room. For me, uh, the way people blend orchestral and samples is a little bit like how you take milk in your coffee, milk being samples. So, you know, John Williams is probably your tall, venti, black Americano kind of guy, whereas Dario might be more of a double espresso. I'd say my stock blend is more of a, a you know, a flat white, where my samples add a kind of velvety, thick, rich texture uh, to the real players. But, you know, daytime television happily serves up, you know, huge cups of steaming hot milk, just, you know, stuff only made with samples. But find me the halcyon days when daytime TV employed symphony orchestras to underscore, say, pebble mill. This is where your role as a head of department comes into play. You've got to, you've got to figure out a budget for what you really need the live players to do and how much food you want to put on your family's table. Now, for me, uh, I often find sweeping strings really, really difficult to do with samples. So, if it's a period drama, I'll, you know, I'll really invest in a serious kind of uh, manpower there. Whereas this thriller that I'm working on at the moment, it's a smaller string section, but I've invested in an amazing specialist musician in Leo. Or sometimes I'll get a really big band and just get them to play on half the cues, and then maybe if it's like a pizzicato-y, comedic section, they don't have to play on that at all. The only common thing between all of the scores I've written is I've never not used at least one musician. I don't think there's ever an excuse. Daryl Alexander from Cool Music once said, uh, samples can make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Real musicians will make you cry. So here with Paul, and why are we here? And Paul, Paul is the, the, the lesser seen uh, partner of business <laughs> of Spitfire Audio. And why are we here today? Well, I'm just coming for a few free, free drinks. A few <laughs> free drinks in the Houses of Parliament. Yeah, very impressive actually. Because Spitfire is part of the parliamentary review of exciting up and coming businesses since. It actually gets better and better, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Go through. <clears throat> and it's a total Victorian folly. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I mean, it looks a little bit like uh, <clears throat> one, of the, one of these kind of quite scary films, isn't it? That you suddenly see all these figures. Amazing. What sound do you want? We've got... <laughs> this is our social media counter. Brilliant. Ooh, so does it just do Facebook or have you got... A... No, so we've got um, Twitter. Brilliant. And then I'll also today we'll set up our Instagram, so to be done on the list today. Fantastic. And it's great. And, and doing... YouTube subs? Uh, I haven't set up YouTube as well either yet. But That's it took so me quite cool. a while yesterday, <laughs> which I was meant to be doing work. It was a bit of a distraction, brilliant. It was Excellent. A but it's great. 
So on the question of uh, do samples put musicians out of work, I'm definitely in the no camp. The thing that concerns me about um, the music industry and its attitude towards technology is its deep suspicion and legislation uh, to fight new technology always just fucks the music industry in its own face. Whether it be the MCPS legislation that led to all of the pirate ships being moored in international waters or the total and utter failure to recognise and embrace the MP3, the music industry tends to blame the wrong technology. Did samples put drummers out of work? Well, I, I don't think they did. I think turntables and sequences and the 808 changed uh, the way that we made drum music. It would be like criticising the piano for putting harpsichord players out of work. You know, it wasn't JV 1080s that emptied concert halls in the late 20th century. It was boulez. There was a moment in the 1990s where orchestras became cool again because at that point the film music was really cheesy and the concert music was unlistenable and what the likes of Hans Zimmer, Massive Attack, Craig Armstrong, David Arnold did but in particular Hans's invention of orchestral sampling, hacking the sampler so that he could create the world's largest orchestra has led to consumption of orchestral music uh, on a scale we've never witnessed before. There are entire segments of the population, young people, who consume orchestral music more than any other idiom, whether it be their blockbuster films at the weekends, Game of Thrones, a computer game. It's absolutely everywhere, and it's everywhere, in my opinion, because of the explosion of orchestral sampling and what it has done to democratise the orchestral arts. I know it's <clears throat> not like the good old days, but what were the good old days? I mean, when I was growing up, there were three TV stations, and they were only on like for half of the day. Though. And a small, closed group of people making and earning money out of music. There's more points of sale now for, for music than there ever has been historically. So those of us who can work out how to make great music, the right notes in the right order, that sounds great quickly, um, we stand to really benefit out of this age. I mean, look at me, uh, comprehensively school educated, terrible education, uh, can't really read music, was shut out of the fortress of orchestral by tutors who I didn't share the same musical taste with and um, the only way I could have written the 50 odd film scores that I've written over the years and I think over a hundred TV scores and some, is with technology, is with samples, it challenges the paradigm and I just see samples as a means of me interfacing with musicians so instead of it being pencil and paper so do I think it's going to go back to the good old days of, you know, latter-day Jeff Vaccaro's doing every other session in town? I'm not sure. I don't think it's going to return to the days of massive orchestras doing light entertainment programmes every night on the BBC. But try and book a symphony orchestra at Abbey Road anytime soon. It's difficult. Those boys and girls are busy. I guess what I'm trying to say is I think um, these are the good times. The potential is there. We just need to work out to deal with the huge demand that's out there. And I do think that is where samples can help us. I'm looking forward to, like, in the future, one day hearing that one of you has just finished scoring the 2000th episode of an augmented reality thriller series on David Lynch's YouTube channel. Cortado style. Sorry? I was just saying something to the camera.